Good evening and welcome to the fourth installment of Solano Pride's five-day series focusing on Transgender Day of Remembrance. My name is Jamie Ells Booth. My pronouns are them, they, and he, him, and I'm the Youth Services Coordinator at Solano Pride Center. As this week's speakers have all mentioned, the transgender community has been getting a lot of unwanted attention from the White House within these past four years. The majority of this attention is centered on transgendered rights and anti-transgender policies. Title IX guidance for educators specific to the LGBT community were withdrawn. Transgender people were barred from serving in the military. Appropriations were removed and or redistributed for HIV AIDS research. Anti-transgender policies surrounding homeless shelters were put into place. The words transgender and diversity were banned in CDC reports. Challenges at the state levels regarding bathroom bills, religious exemption laws, and 2020 saw the saddest milestone. Over 50 transgender and gender nonconforming people were reported as being killed by violence in the US, over 300 worldwide, and most in the US were black and Latino women. And even more concerning, that number grows daily. All of this media attention leads many to believe that there is a new phenomenon of, of being transgender, especially in people under 25, and is more often than not considered a fad or a phase, and that we're just giving too much attention to a new group of people that have just popped up. The only problem with this thinking, it's just not true. Transgender people have been around throughout all of human history. Believe it or not, transgender people have existed for as long as humans have been around. In fact, throughout the majority of human history, we have recognized and even celebrated in some cultures more than two genders. And to me, this makes a lot of sense because look, the majority of the LGBTQ community knows from lived experience that there are more than two ways to express your gender identity. In fact, science has proven that there are at least six distinct biological sexes and limitless gender expressions. That is, if you believe in science. Transgender people have always been visible, but thanks to new technologies and brave community, our stories are being shared with a much wider audience. Groundbreaking television shows and movies, a vibrant online community, and social media increase our visibility. This space in the public eye helps humanize gender and transgender people and our stories and brings attention to the vast disparities and violence that exist in our communities. But this recent visibility is only telling a part of the story. To talk to us more about that, it is my pleasure to introduce Ms. Bob Davis. Ms. Bob is the founder and director of the Louise Lawrence Transgender Archive in Vallejo, California a grassroots organization about 32 miles northeast of San Francisco. She served two terms on the GLBT Historical Society Board of Directors. From the mid 1990s to the early 2000s, she wrote about transgender history and community publications such as Ladylike Transgender Community News and the last four issues of Transgender Tapestry. In the past years, she has presented talks on transgender history at Sonoma State University, City College of San Francisco, Napa Valley Com Community College, GLBT History Museum, one of my favorites, the Howard Zinn Book Fair, and notably, Queering Memory 2020, a conference presented by archives, museums, libraries, and special collections in Berlin, after which she was invited to turn the talk into the an article for the trans and HIV AIDS issue of Transgender Studies Quarterly by Duke University Press, which is due out later this year. Another article, The View From Now, will appear in Life Trips, Navigating Transgender Aging, Illness and End of Life Decisions, edited by Jude Patton. Ms. Bob teaches music at Napa Valley College and City College of San Francisco. As always, we hope that those of you that are live streaming these evenings presentations will join us in the discussion and post any comments or questions you have for Ms. Bob in the chat. We'll monitor those and pass those along to Ms. Bob. 
Good evening and welcome, Miss Bob. I'd love it if you would start us off by telling everyone more about the Louise and what you'll pre be presenting to us. Thank you, Jamie. I had no idea you were going to do so much research for my introduction. Um, hi, my name is Ms. Bob and I'm a collector. And I say that in the same spirit as people who rise at 12 step meetings, make their way to the front of the stage and go to the podium to admit long years of addiction and abuse. Hi. My name is Ms. Bob, and I'm a collector. Stamps, seashells, turtles, Davy Crockett trading cards, mad magazines, newspaper clippings about Three Penny Opera. My mother would say that any time I got more than three of anything, it became a collection. This collection, I didn't start until 1979, when the first time I had an apartment of my own when I was living alone. And I'm still collecting. I'm still looking for new things. I got some this very week and I would trade my virginity for a copy of Transvestia volume one, number one, January, 1960. But unfortunately it's too late. I'm a collector, but I'm not a miser. When I was on the board of the GOBT Historical Society, people began coming to my home to look at the collection. Uh, I even had one researcher, a PhD student come. And when I got here to Vallejo, after I semi-retired, I turned the collection into the Louise Lawrence Transgender Archive, and which for three years until the coronavirus closed us down was, was available. Uh, for scholars, for community members, for curious individuals to come and visit. Um, this talk is a kind of tour through the photograph collection of the archive. It's only a small sampling of the over 2000 photographs in the Louise, Ar Ar in Louise Lawrence archive, but I've organized these with the idea of, is this a representation, a presentation of gender identity? Or is this photograph showing us something else, something entirely different? This is, these are questions that occurred to me during the course of my collecting. And these are some of the guidelines I established for myself to try and figure out who I'm looking at. First question I ask is, is this an expression of gender identity? Can we see that? The second is, is this acceptable to society at large, this presentation? Sometimes that impinges greatly on the first question. And I'm always, always interested in, is there anything erotic or sensual involved in the photograph? Or is it not dealing with that world at all? I should tell you that the identifications I'm going to make are subjective. I will tell you the criteria I use, but they are new, no, there's no reason for you to have to disagree, to agree with me. And the pro, and if the identifications are subjective, so are the pronouns. I, in most cases, I avoid the use of the pronoun they when giving this talk. Almost all of the photos are pre-1970. And the people in these photos, I don't feel would recognize the pronoun they, a plural pronoun applied to an individual as we do today. So rather than identify them, which I feel is arbitrary because it's not something they conceive of, I, go by the criteria I've established as to whether I think there is a expression of transgender identity present or not and pronoun them appropriately. In terms of my pronouns, I really don't care. As long as you talk about me, I don't care what pronouns you use. So let's start the talk by 
looking at photographs of people who have self-identified as transgender and see what themes we can find with them. Okay, we're sharing screens now. And let's make this full screen. Come, come, there we go. This is Bobby, Bobby Thompson. <clears throat> I acquired her personal archive over 25 years ago. A long story, I'll be happy to tell it if anyone is curious enough, but <clears throat> Bobby had many, many copies of this photograph in that archive. A couple of eight by tens, but most of them were, I think, called five by seven smaller photographs, snapshot size photographs. Why would she have so many? To trade them through the mail with other transgendered women, other people who identified who she knew through various associations. Notice two things about this photograph. One, Bobby went to considerable effort to look authentic in her gender of choice. This is gender presentation. This is not a, a satire on gender. Second, the sense of privacy, the clothes drapes, the idea that she's alone. And when we have these photographs like this, and there are many, then we have the other question, who took it? We know Bobby identifies as transgender because she was cover girl for Transvestia number 22, August 1963. She wrote an autobiographical article as all the cover girls did called Bobby Goes Private, where she talked about her personal feelings about transgender identity, though she did not use the term. The term was coined, we believe, sometime in the 70s. This was 63. But in the article, she ends up by saying, quote, I can sum up by saying, as a man, I exist. As a woman, I live. So I think we can be pretty sure that were she alive today, and I know she's not, the collection was sold after her death, her archive was, that she would be somewhere along the transgender spectrum. Now, Bobby was a member of the uh, early transvestite club when Virginia Prince started called originally uh, Full Personality Expression, FPE, uh, later called Triest Society for the Second Self. Um, and, but she also, in a, in, a, in a previous article in Transvesti number 18, six months earlier or so, eight months earlier, December 1962, she wrote an article called Bobby Goes Public, which is about her performing in drag as a female impersonator. On the, this, in the back of this photo, oh, in the article, she talks about that she has performed for, quote, a group to which I belong, which she doesn't identify. But looking at this and the other photos, I'm pretty sure the group is an American Legion, uh, veterans of foreign wars, some kind of veterans group. They're the men in the uh, military-like uniforms. On the back of this, it says, diamonds are a girl's best friend. And then it says below that quote unquote, she'll do it again. And she did. She performed for this group or other groups in drag many times. From this photo, we can see a couple of things. One, even without the heels, she'd probably be the tallest person on stage. And I love the microphone on the boom. It's just, and don't know the scene, don't know anything else about this show, but this is, Oh, this, this, this is the other photo I have from Bobby's collection for performing. Actually, it's not the only other one. Now, going back to the question of who took the photo. In most cases, we don't know for those solo shots. But here's a couple where we do, where we have the first selfie. This is a photo from France. I have a dealer friend who goes to France regularly, to Europe once a year. I purchased this from him. And our lovely, our lovely uh, model here, if you look at her hand, you maybe have trouble seeing it, but she's got one of those squeeze balls. You can, you can operate a camera, many camera, old style cameras, by squeezing on a ball into a hollow tube, the air pressure 
clicks the camera and takes a photograph. And you can see the rubber tube going here and going down the doorknob here. This is part of the door. This is that tube. So she was taking a photograph of herself. Notice the way she's hidden her genitals too. She wants to look female, feminine, down to the skin. To me, this is a sign of some version of a transgender identity. There are over 100 photographs of the girl in the mirror in Bobby's collection. She's wearing 30 different outfits in them. You can see that she's holding a camera. She's taking a photograph of herself in the mirror. Here's the doorknob. The mirror is again leaning against the door. Here she is in another outfit. You can see the doorknob more clearly. And here is yet another one. I tracked her down. I found her in three issues of the early of the set from the 70s of Transvestite World Directory, which was a contact magazine run by the Empathy Club, from, which is in Seattle, Washington. Her ad in all three publications reads like this. First, the format, the state, Connecticut, and then mail, M-A-L-E. Interested in corresponding or meeting with other TVs, dress every day, love high heels and high fashion, will answer all, Johnny, spelled J-O-N-Y, and then box EC805. EC would be Empathy Club, which was which produced the empathy publications and was the group, a national organization in Seattle with uh, clubs around the country. Let's go back to those drapes. You see a lot of photos like this one uh, behind closed drapes in a rather anonymous setting. This looks more like a someone's home, but often it's in a motel or a hotel room, which this could be. This lamp to me screams hotel. This is Eileen. She was cover girl for Transvestia number 16 in August 1962. She and Bobby, I have a set of photos of them, uh, two different sets, where they rented a room together and they spent the evening taking photographs of each other. They even would go out and one would take a photo. You never see a photo with the two of them in the same frame because when one is in the frame, the other is using the camera. Uh, Here's another shot, another set of drapes, another anonymous location. Now, this might be someone's living room. I don't know who this is. All I know about it is it's from March of 1972. It's another one of Bobby's friends, someone she exchanged photographs with. But sometimes behind those drapes, people were forming community. Sometimes those drapes were closed because we wanted to get together and we wanted to have what the philosopher Akeem Bey calls a semi-autonomous zone, an area where we have taken and kept the world out so that we could, if even for one glorious evening, be ourselves. Remember these drapes. We're going to see them a number of times through the, through the talk. Also the uh, cocktail table and the uh, the pillows that match the drapes. This is Sheila Norris and uh, Paul, whose last name I don't know. Sheila was the uh, literary editor for Transvestia and she wrote book reviews, like over 40 book reviews uh, about books relating to transgender or gender, sometimes in a very loose way. Um, she was a friend of Bobby's. This is from Bobby's collection. And uh, there's about a dozen photos of her that she sent to Bobby sometimes with things written on the back. And on the back of this one, she wrote, see how petite I look beside Paula. This shows, obviously the membership in, in trans, the, being an editor of Transvestia shows an interest in, in gender and transgender, but this shows how vested she is in appearing as feminine as possible. Yeah, Paula is really tall. And it makes Sheila look more petite, something I've never been able to do. These, oh, here are those drapes again. This is Susanna Valenti. Susanna Valenti and her wife Marie had a series of two different uh, resorts in the Catskill Mountains, where once a month they would have 
transvestites only. And that's how people then would probably have identified. Um, and this is Sheila, excuse me, this is, this is Susanna in her home uh, in one of the two resorts. And in uh, 2005, this page is from a book uh, called Casa Susanna. That was the name of the second uh, resort. Uh, and this is a page from that book. Uh, Robert Swope, who was the co-editor, talks about how he, quote, discovered the personal photo collection, might, one might say the family album of Susanna, a professional female impersonator, while rummaging through a refrigerator-sized box of old photographs at a New York City flea market. Uh, those photographs are now at the um, Art Gallery of Ontario, uh, who purchased them. Uh, there are over 400 photographs in that collection. Um, and this book, which only features about 140 of them, came out before the collection gains tremendous notoriety. Here's some more photos. And oh, look, here's our friend Sheila. So Sheila, and Sheila was at Casa Susanna. We have photos of her in front of those same drapes that we saw Susanna in front of. So we know that these are people in the same social, social circle. In this social circle becomes the core, the or community for the United States. These women, transgendered women, who connected with each other after World War II are really the beginnings of the transgender community as we know it and as we, as we uh, experience it. Now, interestingly enough, there were some photos from the Casa Susanna book that also appeared in Bobby's collection. This is from the book, just like this. There's very little information in the book. There's the intro and then not another word. There aren't even page numbers, which makes it really difficult to try and talk to someone about what photo you wanna discuss. So here we have three people. We don't know who they are. Well, that's Susanna again. But in the photo of the same three people in Bobby's collection, we can find out that standing in the center is Ella. And on, the side, and on the end is Alice. They look so much happier in this photo. But also notice the cars in the background, some zippy little sports car and a Thunderbird, a Ford Thunderbird, one of the old ones that still had the portal in the side. So these are, some of these people had some money. There's another photo from the Casa Susanna book, another photo taken at Casa Susanna. This is Lily. Lily goes on to become Transvestia cover girl number 48 in 1967. Uh, the caption to, the, to her photo, which was written by uh, Virginia Prince, the publisher, editor, editor and publisher, says, Lily thinks nothing of violating all of Susanna's guidelines for TVs by wearing pants, bathing suit, bikini, and does it at Casa Susanna yet? Susanna had a long running column in Transvestia. And among the things she did is she would give fashion tips. She was, after all, a professional female impersonator. Conveniently, her wife, Mary, owned a wig shop and made wigs, a wig shop on Times Square. And she had a great large number of transvestite clients. So Lily would via, Lily was comfortable enough in her feminine persona that she would not listen to Susanna's advice about how to dress. She dressed as, as she wished. One more from the, from the series. This is someone who appears both in Casa Susanna and in uh, Bobby's collection. This is Kay. And I really am, was so taken with Kay at first because Kay is going out. There's a photo of her heading outside. Kay's not limited. She doesn't stay behind those drapes. She goes out, she travels. And she, her, her cover story talks about her signing the guest book of a motel with her, with her name in such feminine, feminine hand. There's 12 photos of her in Bobby's collection. There's including one that's by a Christmas tree, which uh, not at Casa Susanna, judging by the drapes. When I read Kay's short autobiographical piece, I was really astonished because the lengths that she went to in order to be able to enjoy this time 
cross-dressed and, and, and living as a woman was immense. She had her, she had a separate room built in her, built in the garage in the business she owned. She had kept all her clothes in there behind a clock closet in a door that no one else had the key to. Kay was really invested in being, in having this be a part of her life. So now that we've looked at a bunch of people who identify, who we can identify as transgender in our use of the term, they would call themselves transvestites or later cross-dressers, because there was a move at one time to uh, eliminate the medicalization of the term transvestite. It was a medical term, and we didn't feel we were sick. So let's look at some conclusions. If you find a group of photos and you find multiple images of someone cross-dressed in multiple outfits on multiple occasions, you're pretty coupled with a desire to look genuine in the gender of choice. You're pretty sure that you're looking at some manifestation of transgender identity. Other factors that can figure into this are privacy. Is the photo taken in a situation where no one else will see, where the room feels private, maybe even claustrophobic? Is the location anonymous? Not their home, but did they rent a motel or a hotel room? And sometimes, is there a sense of community? Now, sometimes you'll see a sense of camaraderie, a bunch of guys getting drunk and putting on, putting on bathing suits. That's not the same thing. Now, there were certain places and times, even during the 50s, 60s, and earlier, when cross-dressing was accepted, and all kinds of people might cross-dress. This photograph was taken at the officer's club at Major Air Force Base, Major Airfield, California. The photographer was Phil E. Wilmer. He was a professional photographer. His stamp was on the back. The date of this photograph was August 14th, 1948. I think they're just in masquerade. I don't think this is a statement of identity. I think this is just people having a good time. And I love the guy rolling his eyes here. <laughs> What's going on? And since it's 1948 and the military, I think the corn cob pipe here may have something to do in a very vague way with Douglas MacArthur, uh, the uh, general who had the big fight uh, in this time with uh, pre then President, G President uh, Truman. Another type of acceptable cross-dressing is what I call spur of the moment cross-dressing. Here's a good example. This is Ben Haywood from room 102 Clemson in January, 1937. I don't know whether it's Clemson Hall or Clemson University in Texas, but he was coming from the shower. Somebody pointed a camera at him and he held his, his washcloth up to hide his breast. It's sort of feminine looking, but that's okay. He's joking around. And one other thing that this expresses, this expresses that he is secure enough in his own gender, the masculine gender, to joke around. That he's not threatened by showing a little bit of joking femininity. Here's another case. I call this the good sport. He's wearing his pants, he's wearing his men's clothes underneath this, he's, and he's got his suspenders, which are attached to his uh, pants. And he's washing some clothes, who knows what exactly, something small. He's got a bar of naphtha soap in his hand and a washboard, and he's washing some clothes, and he put on an apron to keep his pants dry, and somebody gave him mama's sleeping cap to put on. And so, spur of the moment cross-dressing. Here's another case. Do you think he left the house wearing that hat? I don't. I think that he saw her, the woman on the, on, on the right, and grabbed the hat from someone up. Me, madam, may I borrow your hat? And then he put it on and they had their photo taken together. But look at her. Her clothes don't fit. She's telling us that it is not fitting for her to wear these clothes. Like Paula and Sheila, she's not invested in looking 
that she fits these clothes. Her message is not, see how good I look in my true gender. Her message is, look how wrong I look, how unfitting it is for me to wear clothes of the other gender. Cross-dressing is often comic and lighthearted. Here's another pair. Why is it whenever you put men in skirts, the first thing they do is want to show off more of their legs? And they didn't even shave. I have two photos of this pair taken in front of the same car. I know nothing else about them, except don't they seem to be having a good time? Um, where am I in my notes? Oh, did you? Oh, yes. Now this, I love this photo because it seems that he had to get liquored up before he before, they, before he was willing to put on the dress. And I love the tennis ball tits also. Um, yeah, he, he, he's not trying to tell you this is he's a woman. He's just joking around. Here's another couple that's having a good time. Actually, the military uniform fits her better than the dress fits him. World War I uniform, don't know the date of this, could probably be maybe 20s. And yeah, you can see in their faces, they're having a good time. They're just clowning around. The next series of photos are unfortunately out of place. I keep revising this talk and I've done some revisions in my head that put these photos, they should be elsewhere. So you'll excuse me, I'm gonna, I'll go through them and I'll try and relate it to either what we said or where they're, where they're or something that's coming where, as to where they're going. In some places it's acceptable to, to cross dress and to do it very well. This is another French photograph some kind of a festival, some kind of a town fair, who knows, obviously we're outside, their clothes fit them very well, but I don't think there's transgender identity being expressed here. I think that we're just having another couple more, taking more care with their, with how they look, but still just having a good time. Then you get to ones that are really, really puzzling. Everything fits well. She didn't take the time to cut her hair. No, the hat doesn't fit too well, but the suit fits immaculately. This is where this photo and some of the next few that come are going to be in a section where I wonder if this was for a theatrical production. Because of course on theater, there's been gender impersonation since there've been characters on stage. And this could be that, of course, now it could be, hey, let's go around the side of the building where no one will see us and let's take the photo there and then you can run inside and change. Don't know. But I do think the stripes in the suit strike me as being somewhat costume-like and theatrical. This is a photo that should go, should go earlier with the people just having fun and a good time. Mostly it's in the uh, talk because I'm very fond of dogs. And then here's some, some others which might be some of theatrical production or might not. Clearly it was taken in a professional studio. There's Van Dyke, which is the name of the uh, a photographer stamped on it, don't you love it? And it says, though you know it's, 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 it's rubbed out on it, it's not rubbed out, but it's not stamped evenly so you can't see, but that says Washington. I don't know whether it's DC or the state of Washington or Washington County in uh, some other in some other state, but is this theatrical or not? Is this a stage production, or are those her clothes? Don't know. For stage productions, of course, unless you're playing a bum, the clothes will be made to fit. Here's another one like that. She's got the handkerchief in the pocket. Even got the fob for the watch for the pocket watch. Again, we're in a professional studio. Was this her clothes? Was this a show? I don't know. I really can't say. This one I've decided ultimately or definitely is from a show. Everything's right except these buttons just look too big for regular wear. It makes to me, it look more like something that's costume. Also, I point to the fact, that, like the other woman, she did not cut her hair. Short hair is not what she wears every day. I think this is temporary. But sometimes, 
just sometimes you look at a photograph and you say, there's something queer going on here. I can't put my finger on it. I can't identify what it is, but I see something queer. Which one do you think is Jimmy? I think Jimmy's on the left. Jimmy's suit fits very well. Jimmy could wear that anywhere. Yes, could this be from a stage production? Possibly. Could this be Jimmy's daily clothes? Possibly. Either way, I love the American flags in the background. The meeting hall, they're in public. The meeting hall is a community center of some kind. No doubt about it. There's something queer going on here. It's a very tiny photograph, probably only about oh, less two and a, an inch and a half, maybe two inches by maybe four inches. It's one of the most tantalizingly erotic photos in the collection, personal opinion. Yeah, there's something queer going on here and aren't they having a wonderful time? This is on an RSVP cruise. RSVP does LGBT cruises. They always have costume parties and events. This was uh, a cruise from 1975 or 76. Uh, it's from a pile of photos I've, I've, I purchased at a sidewalk sale uh, in the late 70s. There maybe was uh, an inch and a half or two inches of photos. They wanted two bucks for them. I jumped at the chance, saved about 35, I think, photographs that featured cross-dressing. Most of them were at a party or a show that they had as part of as part of the as part of the uh, cruise. This next photo I call "So Where's My Marine." This was shot in February twentieth, nineteen forty-two. So we're, we're in the era of World War Two, and what more can I say about this one? But where's my marine? Yeah, there's something sensual going on here, whether she's just teasing us or not. The lampshade wrapped up still as though it tells me that this is a motel or hotel room. She's kicked off her shoes. She brought her own makeup mirror. She's lying on the bed. And I've always wondered, before she took is the photographer someone who she's friendly enough with that she could just expose herself to and tuck and say, now take my shot, take my photo? Or did she make the photographer go into the bathroom while she tucked and said, come on out now, honey? Yes, I know that this could have been done with a timer, but I always like to think that there's another person in the room. Just, just, my, just my preference. Now I'm going to show you three sets of photos. These are cases where we have, I have multiple images of the same person or same group of people. And it's basically a yes, no, maybe situation. There are times when I, it's one set where I feel there is an expression of identity, another set where I'm sure it's not, and a third set where, gosh, I don't know. I call her the tall, thin girl. I've got, uh, oh, I don't say how many. I've got maybe 15 or 18 photographs of her uh, in many different outfits. Here's another one taken in her home. Uh, she does a lot of shots without a wig. Uh, she seems to prefer that. But also we have a beginning of community. This is her friend. They're taking photos outside of the house. I imagine they're still in a private location. And this is her friend who came over so they could share photos here. So you wear the dress and now I'll wear the dress. We'll trade back and forth. Also, she borrowed her friend's wig, I would note. And they even had somebody there who could take it so they could have the photo of them together. I love the tambourine and the gypsy costume. So what can we say about this? Well, yeah. Multiple photos, multiple images, multiple occasions. Yes, I think there is some kind of LGBT trans identity being expressed in the case of the tall, thin girl. Now, 
let's take a look at another photo album. That, they, these are from a photo album I bought. There's 170 photos in the album. They've obviously were picked over by a dealer. Often dealers will pick the photos they want out of an album and then sell the rest of the album separately. I got really lucky this time uh, because of the 175 photos, over 30 of them featured costuming and masquerade. That's a little bit better than 25% than 12%. So this could obviously be a spur of the moment. He's all dressed in his time and say, oh, here, put on Gwendolyn's hat. Here's another one, spur of the moment, right? Just fooling around on an afternoon on September 9th of 1907. And we'll see it's a whole household of cross-dressing. Here, here's, here's one of those two guys again. Again, I, I see cross-dressing, but I don't see identity in this. And sometimes, though, the cross-dressing is only kind of for satiric effect. We have one woman dusting, we have one woman sweeping, one woman is repairing a chair or stool, and the man is, is drinking beer and relaxing. A commentary on domestic life. Let me see where I am. They even did a, oh, this one. This is, this is lovely. Um, I love the way she's repressing a laugh here. And this, this I think it's, it's masquerade. It's not identity. They even did, a mock wedding. There's about six photos from the mock wedding, different scenes from the wedding, the bride, the groom, the bridesmaid, the best man. Um, and remember, this is the media era that is pre-media. There's no electronic media in 1907. It hasn't been invented yet. The best you could have would be a wind-up Edison phonograph. There was no radio yet. So people would make their own home entertainment. This is the era of card games and ball and board games. People would have poetry readings and play readings in their home, musical salons, and oh, tell Gladys to bring her violin, I'll accompany her. Um, so, and these folks like to dress up. It wasn't hidden. They're certainly not hiding it from the children. I love the look on her face with the cigar and the top hat. It's probably the same top hat we saw two or three photos ago. We've seen him before. Uh, and she, he's embarrassed. She's having a wonderful time. And maybe they're heading somewhere. They're all having these boxes and stuff. I'm not sure. Um, they also did costuming when perhaps transgender or cross-dressing wasn't the main focus. Yes, they're in blackface, right? Against the curtain. Maybe they were doing a little home minstrel show. And sometimes there's masquerade, but no cross-dressing present at all. These folks just like to have fun. Here's a photo from their album, and I love the way the two of them are at high tea. So yes, we have a lot of photos of the feature cross-dressing, but no, I don't think there's any transgender identity being expressed. So there's our yes, and there's our no, and now that might be a too right. And now it's time for the maybe. This is a photo album from Nebraska. There are 300 photos in it. 120 photos are photos of children or groups of children. Sometimes there's one or two out, adults around and a children on horses. It's, it's about the children. 42 photos and there are one or two adults portraits. 34 photos that are groups of adults, sometimes with children, sometimes without. The next most number of photos are 18 photos with women cross-dressing. There's no other costuming, no other masquerade present in any of the 300 images. This is more photos than the 16 photos they have of fishing, most of which are photos of the fish and the five photos they have of a train derailment, which happens somewhere near them. And so you have this train basically having gone off the tracks and sitting in a field. They have five photos of that. This one's pickle. And we're going to see that one woman, there's, uh, appears in cross dress in all of the photos. That's her here with a cigar here in the center. And they did a mock wedding also in February 6th of 1916 in Ithaca, Nebraska. Here she is as the groom. There's another photo where the bride is sitting on her lap. And then there's one, so there's two group cross dressing photos the mock wedding, the time when they got pickled, 
they got drunk. And but then there's this third set of a few photos when she and another woman are cross-dressing and there's no occasion that one can note. Uh, note the affection here. In some of the other, in one other photo, the uh, tall woman on the right is not cross-dressed, but wearing women's clothes, probably her own clothes. And she's sitting on this woman's lap who is still cross-dressed. So is there a transgender identity being expressed here? I'm not sure. This is my maybe. I wanna now talk about theater. Because in, in, the, in the theater, of course, cross-dressing on stage is commonplace. But remember Bobby, who we started off with, Bobby Thompson. And remember how she would cross-dress and perform as a female impersonator for the men's club she belonged to. So sometimes, sometimes, female impersonation or male impersonation in this, on the stage can be a manifestation of something that is deep inside of the person. Obviously this is on stage and this is a, uh, Two, two male students playing parts of women. I, I assume this is the mistress and the slave and the slave and the servant from some play we don't know. But this tradition in colleges is very old. Oh, oh I'm, I'm, one, I'm one image ahead of myself. I love these guys. We don't know what the show they're doing, but it's interesting. Sometimes with these groups of men, notice there are more cross-dressed figures, more men playing women than there are men playing men. It may have been a melodrama, I've always thought. This could be, he could certainly make an excellent uh, villain and here's our hero, probably our heroine over here. But again, and the two elderly ants, I don't know. I don't know anything about this, except I know the names of the individuals. This is Charlie and Oliver Carter, Hobart and Randall Walker, and Bert and Charlie Delafries. The names are on the back. But that's all the information we have. Now, when cross-dressing on the stage is accepted by a larger institution, it can become institutionalized. This photograph is a photograph from the Harvard Hasty Pudding Club. The Harvard Hasty Pudding Club presents plays at Harvard University every year, every year since 1795. And as you can see, the costumes can be very elaborate and very, and very expensive. It is Harvard. Um, and the uh, taking the woman's role, they, there's a, a little booklet I have about it. And they talk in there about sometimes some of the male students would keep on their female costumes for the party that came after the shows. I wonder why. After all, being dressed as a woman, presenting as a woman, feeling like a woman allows you certain liberties, certain things happen that wouldn't happen otherwise. You would be unacceptable for you to uh, be held gently in a man's arms, but on stage, that's just fine. And men's, male schools, men's schools and universities is not limited to them. This is uh, a series of photos from the Randall Hall, Rogers Hall School in Lowell, Massachusetts taken in 1909. There's eight photos that I have. The name of the, the theatrical group they called the Splinters. And the Splinters play that year was called the RUUs, if I'm pronouncing it properly. March 19th is when the uh, play was production. This says these are the lovers. This is Becky on one side and Grace Matson on the other. Here's the other couple involved in the play. This is, uh, yeah, these two of these are roommates. I assume they're roommates uh, off stage. Uh, this is Neil. And this is Pat Griffiths. Um, and here's the entire case. Once again, at this girls' school, an academy, high school age people, we have in this production, they've chosen a script that has one, two, three, four, five, six men and boys, but only three women. In the, in the parts, unless this is a boy, a woman playing a boy. Anyway, so here's our, here's, here's Becky again, and here's, here's Neil again in quotes. Um, and so 
again, this is uh, a school production, Splinter's play, the Are You Used? And uh, was anyone finding secret satisfaction in being cross-dressed for this production? We'll never know. This is an interesting choice. This is from the uh, Lucky Bag, which is the 1931 yearbook of the United States Naval Academy at Annapolis. The group is called the Masqueraders. I want to concentrate on this image for me. I love this. Look at the way, okay, we've got the high heels. I wish I had a pair like that. And the wig is here and the pipe, right? Let's not remember the pipe is a very masculine symbol. So are most things that you put in your mouth. I don't know why it's so masculine to put phallic objects in your mouth, but um, but that's to remind us, hey, this is someone not going to let us mistake this for a woman. This is definitely no wig, short hair, pipe, got to be a guy. The name of the company, the Masqueraders from the United States Naval Academy. Here's some photographs from the same production. Here we see all of the characters, all of the cross-dress characters on stage. This is our ingenue all the way on the right, stage left. I don't, can't tell from the script they give us or the list of cast they give us who is who. Of course, we know who the maid is. Um, but, pardon me, let me check my notes. And, um, but again, being uh, cross-dressed, if you, if you had a transgender identity, would give you, on stage, would give you certain advantages. You could swoon in another man's arms, for example. Um, or you could cry, something a man would never do in public. And look at the arm on this guy, and notice he's really quite large. So he's telling everybody at the school, hey, I can do this. I've got this under control. I'm not worried about who I am. Or is he presenting that image and saying to himself, oh my God, I wish I could take this dress home with me after the production closes. The uh, Lucky Bag says, quote, the masqueraders are an integral part of the Academy's routine. And the year is not complete without the masqueraders spring performance. Later on, it says, quote, but even at this institution of great red-blooded brutes, we find a couple of men who properly costumed might have fooled us had it not been for their voices. Quote, Rosea, in the role of the fair heroine, central in this, uh, in this shot, was especially notable, both in appearance and in dramatic ability. For Theatrical productions, it's long been recognized that for female impersonators, there are two archetypes, two molds you can put yourself in. The first is the ingenue, who I call Juliet. I call them Juliet and Nurse. In Shakespeare's play, Nurse has no other name. We only know Juliet. I only know her as Nurse. And Juliet is young. Juliet is pretty, attractive, desirable, innocent. The nurse is older, plain, possibly downright ugly, and um, jaded. Very often the nurse is given to bawdy comments, asides, double entendre. This is, in the photograph, the Bigwood twins, a transgender cross-dressing vaudeville act. Uh, and as you guys would point out to you that their end point very difficult. They were not indeed related in any way, but they performed together. Uh, their names were Billy, Billy and Ray, they quote said Billy and Ray Bigwood. Their, mod, their slogan was pep and personality. I've got about four photos of the Bigwoods. And I can't talk about the pretty ingenue without mentioning Harvey Lee, who was gorgeous, simply gorgeous. To Vera Valdez, who's another professional female impersonator, just to recall the olden days, in quotes, of the late 1930s, and for the price and for the privilege of knowing you, bless you, Harvey Lee. January 19, uh, June 1969. Harvey Lee was using this photograph 33 years after it was taken, and frankly, 
if I looked that good, I would be using that photograph too, 33 years after it was taken. Harvey always performed or often performed with a dog. This is Dundee. He had a Borozoid when he performed at Finocchio's, a beautiful animal, and he was beautiful. And uh, what else can we say? Uh, now we've seen some ingenues, some Juliets. Let's take a look at some nurses. This is an act called Two Old Bags from Oakland when it was performed at Finocchio's. That's Ray Francis and John Lonis. I believe this is Ray and this is John, but I really frankly am not sure. When they performed at Finocchio's, the act was called Two Old Bags from Oakland. The act was also done by the touring Jewel Box Review, who toured in the 60s. Uh, and then they uh, eventually established a Jewel Box Club somewhere in Florida, I've forgotten where. Um, but they, they did this act too, though they would do it, of course, and keep changing the name of the town. The Two Old Maids from Oakland was performed in San Francisco, so they picked on Oakland. If they were doing the act, uh, if the Jewel Box was doing the act, say, in uh, Minneapolis, they might pick on St. Paul and make it Two Old Bags from St. Paul. They would talk to the audience, they would flirt with the men, they would then make comments to themselves about the men of a risque nature. So this is our nurse character. If you know the panto tradition, the Christmas pantos in, in uh, England, the ugly sisters who are always part of the pantos, which are kind of a takeoff from the uh, two stepsisters in Cinderella, the ugly sisters they're called, they're, they're of this ilk. When I was doing this, I was wondering if there were archetypes in male impersonation. And I hit on one, I have a note for it here at the time I was producing, originally creating this. And it, the first was the Casanova, the, the lovable cow, the Rue, the, the man who was loose with the affairs of women. Um, a lot of people did that. Uh, Elvis herself is in the 90s here in San Francisco, Mo B. Dick, M-O-E, capital B period Dick, um, and New York. Uh, there was a Lily Tomlin character in Searching for Intelligent Life in the Universe, a Latino character who was the same kind. And then I, but I wondered, was there a balance for that? Or I only came up with one until recently. I've come up with a second. I have to uh, amend this uh, show to add it because there's the lovable cad and the other male impersonator is the authority figure. Turning the power dynamic on their head. So when you see a male impersonator, a drag king doing some kind of official, military or otherwise, that's the authority figure. Let's look at the, some amateur theatricals now. I got these at an Oakland Hills estate sale. They were all, they were, I got eight photos. They were all from the mid 1950s. It's quite obvious from the bric-a-brac that was around that they, whoever lived in this house had been an Oakland high school teacher. So this is a high school production, whether it's the Parent Teachers Association, the SRD, uh, um, what, what group presented it, whether it's the faculty, I don't know. Here they're doing Cinderella. This is Cinderella, who if it was the faculty, definitely this is the, um, the football coach, the handsome prince, and one of the ugly stepsisters. They did a second production too, where uh, a telling of the poem, the, the shooting of Dan McGrew. Here's Dan McGrew, and here's the lady that's known as Lou with a banner that says Miss Klondike on it. And here's the bartender who acts as narrator for this production. So again, cross-dressing on stage, but I don't think there's identity, even though the same person played a comic character twice. This is another amateur show. It's a whole photo album of all the different acts from what probably was a vaudeville show. I'll talk more about it in the, in the details about who these people are in a minute, but we're gonna be concerned with this person. This is our Julia. She appears in innumerable outfits. And I have a feeling that for an amateur show like this, you probably had to pay for your own costumes, chip in at least, but she only does glamour. Here she is again. Now, maybe it's not a whole new costume, but it is a new hat and a, and a, and a jacket. 
This is the photograph. Oh, this is our second character. This is Nurse. She'll do comic drag, as we'll see in a moment. These, uh, this, these newspapers are what en enabled me to date it because this is from uh, the Battle of Port Arthur, which is between Russia and Japan. Japan wins victory, right? Armed war, Tsar's forces abandon Port Arthur. The Battle of Port Arthur was fought on February 9th, 1904. So this album is from that era, unless they just kept those newspapers around <laughs> And it's from some later era, but I'm going to go with 1904. Um, so here's another sort of the gentleman, gentleman in jodhpurs and English riding costumes. They did have a lot of money for costumes, didn't they? And here's our Juliet in a third costume. Different hat, different dress, different coat. She wouldn't participate in the all women's tennis table team, but there's our nurse there in the tennis table team. And there's the nurse in the women's fencing act. Um, I love the way they're shot against this backdrop, which kind of runs out over on the left. There, there's more performers than there are backdrop. Uh, but she would do this group act, uh, fourth outfit, fourth act, uh, which would have probably been a uh, female impersonator version of a group called the Floradora Girls. Uh, Floradora had women in lovely outfits who would do some songs and spend a lot of time walking and posing on stage looking pretty. Here she is again. We've seen this outfit before, but I just love the photo and I love the delicate little smile on her lips and the parasol. So yes, I think the four outfits the most photographed person in the album, I think we're looking at someone who may indeed have a bit of transgender identity. And for the last photo, I wanna show you a very small photo. And this is a case where one photo enables us to be sure, at least me to be sure, that I'm seeing someone who is transgender. This is a really tiny shot. I don't think it's two inches on the side. It's obviously done in a professional photography studio, spent a lot of time on the hair. I have a feeling that's those bangs may be his hair and then a wig on top, or maybe he had a, his hair long enough that it could be pulled back. The thing that convinces me though is not the costume, even though it's done with great detail, or the fact that they spent money on a professional studio, but this, under the arms. Because if you look at the photograph really, really closely, you can see that someone took a pin and very carefully scratched off the photograph to expose the paper below and to add a waist, to add another feminine physical touch to the image. So I'm reasonably sure this is an expression of transgender identity. And I cry, sister. Thank you. So. Man, Miss Bob, uh, you wanna know something? Every time, every time I, I've gone to the archive and every time I've seen your images, um, I just feel like I'm stepping into people's intimate moments, you know, and um, knowing that you have photographs from when photographs began. Yes. All the way through the 70s. And the 90s. And the 90s. <laughs> um, I think what interests me most is about the periods of history of the, when those photographs were taken. Uh-huh. And what it would mean if you were a trans person in those times and what they were living through. I mean, we were talking about gender issues with the women's right to vote. We were also talking about racial issues. We were also talking, I mean, you have a lot of, pe of pictures of white people. Yeah. But obviously we know that trans people of color have existed right alongside everyone else throughout history. 
I wonder if you can talk about maybe some of some of what a trans person's um, life would have been like during some of those photographs. And well, a lot of them, I feel okay. It kind of depends on how I couldn't do it, and they accepted whatever. Uh, difficulties society would put in their way because it was so important for them to present as they felt deep in themselves. Um, there are dozens of cases. The one that comes up immediately is a historical one from the 18th century, the Chevalier Dion, uh, who um, was a French, was uh, as a young, as a young Lieutenant as a young officer in the uh, military was sent on a spying mission, which he did to the court of Russia, which he did in drag and lived as a woman at the court of Russia for a few years before he was recalled. Uh, then he lived as a man for a while. And um, then he uh, was, it's a very complicated story, but at a certain point, he was ordered by the king to live as a woman. There was great controversy as to whether he was a man or a woman, and the king decided to settle it and said, okay, even though you are a chevalier of the guard, you will now, and he did, he lived as a woman for the rest of his life, even after that king died, even after he moved to England and was no longer under that responsibility at all. He lived as a woman, he lived when he was, he, he died unfortunately in poverty. Uh, with another woman, uh, they were living together. They were not lovers, as far as we know. Um, the other thing that's interesting about him is he was an excellent swordsman, said to be the best swordsman in Europe. So for a while, while living as a woman, he would make money giving exhibitions of swordsmanship and challenge famous swordsmen to duels. So it's a, not uh, exhibition. Not, it wasn't a duel where someone would be, be wounded or, or killed afterward. It was an exhibition of swordsmanship. So a very fascinating character. Um, there's James Barry, Dr. James Barry, uh, post-Civil War. Uh, um, what's the title? What's, what's the, uh, you know, the Surgeon General of the United States, James Barry. Upon James Barry's death, it was discovered that James Barry was a woman. So there are people who just could not live any other way. But then you got people like Bobby, who I think were more common. Bobby, I, I know a great deal about her. Um, I know she had a family. I know she had a wife. I know that she, from her, the statement I read you, that she probably would have been happier as a woman. And she maintained an apartment. She was rather, she was, she was quite successful, apparently. I uh, was able to maintain an apartment uh, separate from her home that she shared with another cross-dresser and they would use that. And she was able to sublimate by performing on stage. And she was able to sublimate by later joining the club, uh, Virginia Prince's National Sorority, male, the world's only male sorority they, she promoted it as. And so there's all kinds of levels. Um, it's very interesting to me to talk about that because when I was growing up, when I was, you know, when people talked about gender, if they were transgender, if they were tr transsexual, they would say that they were in the wrong body. It's interesting to me because I, now when I read things that uh, people, who are in their teens and 20s are writing now, it's completely flipped. It's not that they're in the wrong body. It's that you're not seeing me for who I really am. We've changed where the onus is. The onus is not something that's wrong with me any longer. The onus is something that's wrong with your view of me. And I find that a tremendous change which happened during my lifetime. Um, and I think if that idea takes hold and replaces the model of born in the wrong body, I think that would make a major difference for transgendered people being able to live in a way that 
they are comfortable expressing their true identity, period. Period, and well said. Um, Thank you. We have some, <laughs> we have some uh, questions from the viewers. Um, I won't answer anything personal. Okay. How dangerous would it have been? Well, I'll preface this by you showed a lot of photos from Casa Susana. Yes. That's another one of your presentations that we'll have to provide another platform for. Um, and obviously, those women were in a place where they felt safe and comfortable to be themselves and they dressed and looked like themselves. Yes. And some photographs were taken. I imagine some kept them as tokens to remind themselves of their femininity when they had to go back into a society that wasn't as accepting. Right. How dangerous would it have been if those photos had been made public or if those photos became public? For some people, it would have been absolutely devastating. It would have ruined their marriages. It would have ruined their professional life. There's no question that those photos were loaded. Um, but there's an interesting thing that went on at Casa Susan. Uh, in my research, I read an article in a very, very local, I've forgotten the exact little town, it's a tiny little town in the Catskills, but a, a kind of a local uh, article newsletter from that area, because uh, there had been people up there, you know, researchers looking at the building to, uh, of Casa Susanna and talking to, and there was an article about what the community thought of Casa Susanna. And there was a little, kind of uh, general store, uh, corner store down the road where those women would go shopping. And the woman who owned the store talked mostly about how the fact that they were also overdressed. They would be wearing jewelry. Everybody else around there is probably wearing, you know, sandals and, uh, and jeans. Uh, but they would be wearing jewelry. They'd be wearing uh, dresses in the middle of the day. Uh, so their, their sphere of, of safety was a little bit larger. They could get off the property a little bit. Um, but to return to your question, though, there's no doubt that the implications of uh, being exposed were tremendous. There's one story, I don't remember where I read it, a true story about um, a high school teacher who was also a transgender with cross dress. And one time, who knows how, but uh, some fellow teachers came to say hi. And she opened the door of all cross dress and lost her job the moment she opened that door. Oh, maybe it took a week, but that was it there was probably no thought of appeal. We're not going to trust our young people with someone like you, heaven knows. Interesting you should mention that too, because um, Harvey Firestein, the playwright, wrote, I don't know, maybe five years ago, he was commissioned to write a play based on Casa Suzanne. And what he did in the play was, uh, address that exact situation where the news got out about, about people in the club. And there was one character who was a judge and he was obviously going to have his career ruined. And at the end of the play, when he leaves his daughter, who was very, very angry, and very, very uh, sharp with all the people there, came up to pick him up because he's get the impression, as I recall, he's kind of had a stroke or something because he leaves in a wheelchair to show symbolically how defeated he was that this secret got out. So there's no question this was potent material and it would ruin someone's life in the 50s and the 40s and the 60s. Yeah, no doubt. I. Um... I mean, the Lavender Scare saw a lot of people, you know, um, their lives were just destroyed 
um, people that would be picked up in bars. Mm -hmm. Their names appeared in newspapers. The right. next and their addresses. And their addresses. Right. Yeah. And um, the thing I've always wondered about is were trans people picked up in those situations because they were thought to be gay or were gay people picked up because they were thought to be trans? Right. It's like, you know, it's like, you know, we're, but we're violating the, those, those norms, which were then were held so sacred. Right. And I think, you know, around the 60s and 70s, when androgyny became a thing, you know, that must have left a lot of the law bringers <laughs> scratching their head. They must have just lost their mind. We have another question. Well, actually, we have a couple of statements and a question. I'll read okay. both. Um, this one is from Felix. Bob, Miss Bob, you are an inspiration. I adore you and everything you do, and I'm so grateful to know you. Well, thank you. Um, and a statement from Tristan. Miss Bob, it's always lovely to learn from you. I have to agree with Felix. You're definitely an inspiration. So, oh dear, I hope I'm a good inspiration. Oh, I, I think you are. <laughs> um, here's a question. Was there ever a time in history that cross-dressing or being transgender was accepted in society? Yeah, there were those times. Um, you know, in, I, I, I'm immediately reminded of the court of Nero, the emperor of Rome. I don't remember the name of his, uh, the boy he had as, a, as his lover, um, but he married the boy. He had the boy, uh, um, people address, address the, his, his lover as your highness. Uh, I think that he had uh, the young man surgically altered castrated. I think that was perhaps mutual, uh, probably who, who knows who wanted it more. I've always felt about that. And in the Weimar Republic in Germany uh, during the 1920s prior to the rise of the Nazis uh, and early 30s, there was a, some, it's like, how can I say it? In Paris and other places and even in the 50s, there are places where you can go where it's acceptable. There were bars in San Francisco where you could go. If the bar was raided, the consequences might be, might be drastic. But in that small little autonomous zone, you could feel comfortable. You could express affection for the people you felt affection for. Quote, unquote, women could dance with women. Men could dance with men. This was not uncommon, but it was in certain places only. Think of Stonewall, think of the club, think of the fact that it was mafia owned and the mafia played off the police so there wouldn't be raids, or if there were raids, there would be notice of it beforehand. It's things Jerry Ann talked about uh, two nights ago. Yeah. There were places established, and frankly, a lot was established because there was some money there. People do all kinds of things for money. So yeah, so the uh, Genovese family said, sure, we can make money selling the faggots. We'll sell them drinks, we'll sell them drugs. Sure, we'll do that, who cares? Just don't let them you know, come to my neighborhood. So that's... Uh, we, we have established places for ourselves. Oh, in one of the early issues of Transvestia, either number two or number three, uh, there's someone who wrote in a letter which said, oh yeah, this is like what we used to do in the 40s. I had a club with some friends and we'd get together uh, once a month or whatever the details are of it. But yeah, we will find our community. We will create community even in the most adverse circumstances. About 10 years ago in Iran, when it, in the Islamic Republic, there were a number of men, small group, three maybe, who were arrested for wearing women's clothes, arrested for wearing the burqa in public. Their disguise was discovered. Their punishment was horrible. It was whippings. It was multiple whippings over a long period of time. 
but they found each other, they found a small group, and they tried some. Who knows how many times they had been out in public prior to the time they were arrested. Some things you can't stop. Some things are just party. And you're going to do it, and you're going to face the consequences because you'd rather do that than be miserable every day. I feel like I should have that be on a t-shirt. I just don't know if it'd be big enough for all of that, but. Um, I'll yeah. try and think of something more pithy. Does anyone have a happier question? Yeah, actually we do have a happier question. Um, so you mentioned that you're a collector. Oh boy. Um, and you also mentioned no personal stories or questions, however, <laughs> Try me. I'm hoping this will will catch your interest. So you're a collector, and there are a lot of people that collect a lot of things, myself included. And I like to collect validation, validating things, and I like to be validated. Um, the next question is from Tristan, and says, "Miss Bob, if I missed it, I apologize. But what motivated you to start the Louise Lawrence Trans Archive?" That's really interesting it's, it's that they should ask. Because um, I'm, I'm writing a little autobiographical piece uh, for a book proposal. And um, this is one of the issues I'm going to start with. I feel, okay, person, I, when I first got to, came to San Francisco, so when I came in 1972, was when I first started really coming to terms with the, my transgender feelings. Oh, I dressed as a Cleopatra on Halloween for my senior year in high school. Nothing but fantasies and uh, sometimes erotic fantasies of my own late at night, uh, all through college and a year or so after while I was still living on the East Coast. But then when I moved West, after a year of living as a hippie, I told my girlfriend, we had been living together for two years, I think at that point, a little over a year. And um, I was so nervous about telling her that um, she thought I was talking about her wearing lingerie and high heels, not me wearing lingerie and high heels. Uh, and I tried to join a couple of different support groups uh, that didn't go well. And I kind of feel that once I had this apartment of my own, my own space, in a way, the collecting, my collecting interest, which I'd had all my life, kind of moved its way into the transgender. And it became, for me, a kind of a sublimation, kind of the way I was transgender. I studied it. I looked at photos. I owned magazines. I was being a collector, I was very, uh, if I had volume one, I had to have volumes two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I had to have a complete, uh, what dealers call someone like that is a completist. So I was a completist. If I had one, I had to have all of them. And so I think for me, it really is a way of uh, satisfying the desires that I didn't really quite know what else to do with. So with my own unique preferences and personality, that seemed the most comfortable. Um, and uh, I did, I did a, a good deal of cross-dressing in that apartment and also in uh, previous apartments I had to that in San Francisco. But also um, at that time, I did several performance art pieces that were involved with cross-dressing and transgender, which is another way that I was able to have an outlet. Um, and, uh, you know, because uh, I really didn't, didn't like support groups, people sitting around in a circle that was available. I knew it was there, but it really wasn't me. Uh, 
partially because I think that some of the things, the, some, some of the issues that many people in, in these groups were discussing were things that were either not relevant to me or how I felt or things I had reached a conclusion with. Uh, by this time, for example, I had after a great deal of thought and consideration decided that I wasn't a transsexual, that I was not going to uh, pursue hormones or surgical gender confirmation, that that wasn't what would make me happy. And that's really was my criteria. I mean, I'm, I'm a 20 year old, a 21 year old. I'm dealing with a lot of issues that people at that age deal with. I'm trying to sort things out. I'm on my own for the first time. And I'm um, thinking, well, if I were a presentable woman, would that help me? Would that make me feel better? Would that solve some of the problems I was dealing with in my own life, in my own psychology? And I decided, no, that, that wasn't the problem. Problems were other things. Um, so that's, I think, what I found is that, you know, the collecting sat was satisfying for me. Uh, and I think a lot of that satisfaction is intellectual. I, uh, I, I frequently write, I'm going to say another piece I'm writing, writing now, and there'll probably be one after that. Um, so it, it, it satisfied what I needed on a number of different levels. And I've always been fascinated with history. I was an English major in college, but I took art. I took, at least, I took one history class every semester I was there practically. And, uh, you know, medieval, his two semesters of medieval history, one or two semesters, I don't remember, of English history. Uh, and so it was really a situation where the interest in history, the desire to collect and acquire things, the feelings of transgender, all of that kind of worked together uh, to push me in the idea. And, the first magazine I bought was called Female Mimics International. Uh, there had been a Female Mimics before that. This was a rebirth of the magazine, new, new publisher, new, uh, same publisher, new editor, uh, new look. And so that was the first magazine I ever bought in 1979. And that's how it's from that magazine that I'm able to date the beginnings of the collection. And uh, It made me happy. You know, that's really an uplifting message. Um, following your happy, you know, um, I think that there are so many of us in the LGBTQ community that feel like we're not able to do that safely. Yeah. And I, and I know that there are a lot of people in the transgender and, and gender queer community that find it very hard to validate them themselves at all. What can what can your experience growing up in in these types in those types of times, what what can you say to young people who maybe can't be who they want to be? As, because it's not safe, because there might be people with bias, because other kids are just horrible to other kids, you know. Um, what can they do to find validation? What, what suggestions or can you give them? I'm not sure I'm the person to do that. Because I, at that age, high school, college, I wasn't able to express myself, express this aspect of myself. It just couldn't do it. I was, without knowing what exactly the repercussions would be, I knew they were things I did not want to experience. Um, so I'm sorry that I'm 
not really a, a good counselor in this matter. Um, I, I know the courage it takes. I respect those who stand, stand by their guns, so to speak, but I don't know that I can tell you how that, how to, how to do that, especially now. Remember, when you're talking about young people, I'm the age of their grandparents. And there's a lot of water under the bridge there. And they're growing up in a very different culture and very different society than I do. And I recognize that. Uh, so my advice is of limited utility. Uh, you know, if you ask me how to turn your C into a B in my class, I can tell you about that. But I can't tell you how to live your life. Okay, so let's move, let's move the question around and shine the light in the opposite direction. What can you say to people? What, what, what could the young people tell me? What can you, what would you say to people your age, my age, that aren't youth, about validating transgender and genderqueer people? What would you say? I would say, you haven't, got, I would say you haven't got much time left to make peace with yourself. And that's important. Also, I would say that probably if you've been repressing something like an LGBT identity to age 70, that there's a whole raft of psychological issues there that need to be dealt with either in group or with counseling. Because if you haven't found peace with that part of yourself, when your life, when more of your life is lived and you know that more of it has already been lived and you know that your strongest, you know, healthiest years are behind you. Oh, that's sad. That's very sad. And what would you say towards, and I know people in our communities that have trouble with respecting pronouns. I know older people that aren't in our communities that consider transgender people other. Yeah. What can you say, how can we teach those types of people to be more validating, affirming, inclusive, loving? It's hard. It's interesting because I can remember when um, the, uh, There, there was a, a, early in the uh, gay pride movement after Stonewall, there was a lot of controversy about transgender people, cross people who were cross trans being at things like the Christopher Street Parade, which was the forerunner of uh, pride celebrations. And uh, there's even some of it online on YouTube of, uh, I think it might've been 72, I'm not sure when uh, the, the, the uh, radical lesbians and the uh, male SM community, neither of them wanted any transgender speakers to appear at the Christopher Street Parade after, at this, on the stage. And uh, finally, one of the organizers, they, they, it's a whole story and I don't know that we need to do it, we do it now, but yeah, there was, there is that feeling that uh, and it, it, to me, it underscores something that we believe, or so many of us believe in the gender community, which Virginia Prince uh, sloganized as uh, sex is what's between your legs, gender is what's between your ears. And that dichotomy is really hard for some people to, to, to bridge, you know? Um, I tend to be, if I were in a situation where there were people who did not want me present because I was transgender, there's two ways to react to that. 
One is you can get right up in their faces. And I don't think that's going to win. I wouldn't leave the room. They would have to throw me out. But I would be there, but I wouldn't purposely make a fuss. If I did anything, I would try and contribute positively so that they would see the value of having a transgender presence in their discussions rather than demand. Now, there are people who would say that I uh, am a uh, chicken and, not, uh, and that I should stand up more for myself. But knowing myself, I don't think I would. But I think I would try and make a contribution that would be recognized as appropriate and useful. Then what I'd be working, what, what I'd be maneuvering for was an invitation to come back. Yeah. Let them want me. And people do, obviously. Uh, I'm wanted in seven states. <laughs> By many more, and 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 pretty much, I mean, around the world. Um, you know, I would like to have a conversation another time about about the LGBT people during World War II. I think that's a fascinating snapshot in time of of what we know and and the way that things culminate and how society kind of collectively comes back to itself sometimes without pieces that they lost along the way. Um, There's a wonderful book called Coming Out Under Fire about uh, queer, queer people in World War II. And one of the things they talk about in this book is how the, basically it was the military that queered San Francisco. Yeah, because all these people who were coming out from the Pacific Ocean, from the Pacific, were dropped off at Fort Mason. Right, and an awful lot of the gay people stayed. Well, Paul Cadmus, a famous, famous LGBT painter. I know his. I know his work. Who who he painted the fleets in, and it hung in the Pentagon in the Department of the Navy for years and years, and nobody realized that it was portraying homosexual men with sailors and transgendered women. Oh, with, I'd love to see that painting. Oh, well, just look it up online. I uh, will. I didn't know that one. It is a beautiful testament to how um, throughout history, we have been there and we are there clandestine-like. Sometimes it, it would talk about gay men wearing a, a red bow tie or yeah. a red tie, you know, to signify, hey, I am me. Is there anything that a transgendered person throughout history would wear or keep on them when they... I don't know of any... Um significators like that. I really don't. Um, I, in fact, it's led me to believe, like, I wonder, like, you know, when I'm hearing about this group in the 40s that was mentioned in the letter in Transvesti about how they would get together so they could cross-dress at someone's flat, you know, once a month, how did they meet each other? Yeah. How did it start? Okay, if you know it's a gay bar and you go to a gay bar, then everybody knows why you're at the gay bar, right? And if you find that you've gone into the wrong bar, you're going to leave. <laughs> and maybe they met them, maybe, and maybe they met themselves there. But so many of these people uh, from the mid century, the Bobby and her friends, and all the Castle Susanna people, so many of them are professionals. One of them, they was, uh, oh, I can't remember her name right now, but she was, a, she was an airplane pilot, uh, you know jobs with you know, tremendous responsibility. There were lawyers, there were accountants, there were you know, professionals. Uh, okay, Virginia Prince, Susanna, and Bobby all had advanced degrees. They all had a bachelor's and something after it. In uh, Virginia's place, it was a P in Virginia's case, it was a PhD in chemistry. Wow. From, the, from, 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 from UC. Uh, which is how she met Louise. Uh, 
and I'll tell you about that in a second. But oh, but um, I've forgotten what Susanna's degree was. But Bobby was an engineer. She had a PhD in engineering. So the, these are people who you know had gone through, were able to live in society and go through these institutions successfully. Louise Lawrence came to UC and gave a talk about transgender. It wasn't called that, of course. It's probably about transvestism or something like that. Virginia Prince was a graduate student. This happened at UC in San Francisco. And Virginia um, then tracked down Louise and went to uh, her home and to meet her, because Louise at this point, Louise started living as a woman in 1942. It was after a marriage of hers had gone to pot. I think driven, I think driven in, uh, in part by her transgender identity. Uh, and she decided, this is who I am. She's, uh, you can read about, there's, a, there's an article you can find online called Harry Benjamin's First 10 Patients. Harry Benjamin was Christine Jurgensen's doctor. He was an endocrinologist. Uh, he's attributed with having been the man coining the term transsexual. And he wrote extensively about the difference between transsexuals, transvestites, physical attributes, all, all, kinds, of, all kinds of stuff. And he, um, so his, his first 10 patients. Virginia, when she met Louise, must have been tremendously impressed because Supposedly, her name, Virginia Prince, the name, that's, that's, not her, that's not her birth name, but that's the name she chose because Louise lived near the intersection of Prince Street and Virginia Street in Berkeley, when she, where, where, Virginia, where Virginia went to visit her. Probably the first person she ever met who was living in the gender of choice full time. Virginia and uh, Louise worked on at least one project together. There was a pre, before, in the late 50s, before Transvestia, which Virginia Prince started in January 1st or January of 1960, there was another magazine. There's only about five issues of it. It's more like a pamphlet, large pamphlet, um, which five people put together. Two of them were Virginia Prince and Louise Lawrence. I had never seen a copy of it till I went to the University of Victoria in British Columbia, which has a wonderful graduate and undergraduate program in transgender studies, and also the world's largest transgender archive. Uh, they do a biannual conference called Moving Trans History Forward. Uh, this year, it'll be online in March. You might wanna look it up. Uh, because there are presenters from all over the world. People come from all over the world for this conference. Every year it has grown more than doubled in size from the original. This, is, this would be the fourth conference. Um, but uh, I saw they had an exhibit uh, at the last conference in 2018. And I saw uh, a copy of the original Transvestia there for the first time. I even touched it, read one article. Very exciting. Yeah, you're not a completist anymore. Am I? Am I right? I can't get it all. I mean, I still think about the things that I would have had if I could have afforded them. Um, and I don't want to quote you on what you would have traded for Transvestia Number One, but would it be a <laughs> would it be a safe bet that? Uh, if that just showed up on your door one day, that just rock your world to. Uh... Oh yeah, but it, it, it would be uh, it, would, it would be a gift of astounding generosity. I mean, considering what those early issues of transvestia sell for these days, uh, it, it's a really interesting thing. I've never I've never been able to sit down and read it. But okay, Virginia Prince had a drawing. I don't know if you did it of her sitting at a vanity doing her makeup. That drawing is the cover of transvestia issues numbers one, two, and three. Virginia is a controversial character and quite uh, 
taken with herself. She coined the term trans, transgender, at least that we believe she did. I know, I know a researcher, uh, oh, this is another thing you might want to look at, the Digital Transgender Archive. It used to be a college, a Holyoke, a Holy Names College in, in, in Massachusetts. Now it's at Northeastern University. It is a magnificent collection. They have, uh, I, I spent days and days and days two years ago, Xerox uh, scanning uh, newsletters. Newsletters newsletters are really special because magazines are different. Newsletters are the community talking to itself. Magazines are much more public. And they're, they're, they're not as within a small group to really find out a lot of more detail and intimate things. Even if people aren't specifically saying it, you can read it through what they are saying about how they're living their lives because they're talking to members of a very select community. So newsletters are something that's really special uh, if, you're doing re if you're trying to do research into this area. Um, what was the question? That was that note. I'm not going to go backwards. Uh, I'm not going to tell you, but so you heard it here, folks. If you have transvestian number one, please consider donating that to the Louise Lawrence Transgender Archive. I actually know where there's an issue, but I can't pry it out of their hands. Let's let's talk about how they, when they do want to donate that or any type of memorabilia or historical artifacts, how can they get in touch with the Louise? And, and can you talk about that process for for like researchers and sure. Well, we 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 have a website. Uh, one of the one of the great pieces of luck uh, I've had in starting this project is that uh, a mutual friend connected me with a, a transsexual woman who is a graphics designer and a web designer, and so we have a website that makes us look so much more professional than we ever should. So just go up and look at the Louise Lawrence Transgender Archive website. Uh, and we have, it's, I am, it, it, there's not as much to it as I like. I'm very proud of the photo gallery that we have. So it needs some reorganization, but very proud of the photo gallery. We're a uh, sponsored project of the LG, GLBT Historical Society, which means that uh, when you click our donation button on the website, you, uh, you're you donating through the Historical Society. So because they're a nonprofit and have all the proper IRS and uh, state franchise tax board paperwork filled out, the donation is tax deductible. If you wanna donate objects, things, well, then you have to, there's an email link there too. It's pretty easy, lltransarchive at Gmail. Uh, and you can, uh, the other thing too is that it doesn't have to be 25, 30, 40, 50 years old to be of interest. The collection is quite eclectic. One of my things I'm very excited about getting now is I have a run of the first 10 issues of a local zine called Transvestia Zine that's done by, I think, well, he, he, he's changed his name to October. I knew him as Jason but I, he changed his name to October. And uh, I think he's not yet 20. And he's producing this and he's getting articles from all over the world. Boy, the way, the way the, uh, he and can work social media to make these connections is uh, really uh, fascinating. Uh, so I'm interested in contemporary stuff. And if it's something we already have, it is still useful to us. Because if we have it, maybe the Historical Society in San Francisco does not, or uh, the archive at uh, the University of, University of Michigan, the Labadee Collection. Uh, and uh, I'm in the middle of trying to institute an exchange with the Lily Elba Archive, which is another grassroots community archive that I, I met the uh, director in Berlin when I was there. So I'm going to be sending them, for example, a, uh, a year's worth uh, six issues of uh, the newsletter from, uh, I think it's 89 or 90, 
from uh, ETVC, Educational Transvestite Channel, which used to be a mammothly large support group in San Francisco. They changed their name to TGSF, Transgender San Francisco, uh, in the beginning of the century here. And now they're, because of the, the internet's really changed all that. They call the clubs, all the newsletters and stuff, that's all online. All the connections are being done that way. So many of them are that there are less groups, less public, less community publications, but more websites. So it's a whole different kind of. If you wanted to document, it's a whole different kind of documentation now. But so yeah, I'm interested in damn near anything, right? Put a woman in a pair of pants, a man in a skirt. Sure, I'll take a look at it. You know. I... <laughs> I am always just so blown away by how humble you are. I mean, you are you are an expert in your field, and and there are reasons for it. Your your memory for things and details and just it's astounding. It's amazing. Sorry. We have one more question, um, and this happens to be about what was the name of the painting? Please repeat it. It was called The Fleet Is In by Paul Cadmus, and you can Google it. Um, I'm sure I have, I have his book. Um, I don't know if, I don't know where that painting hangs any longer because it was taken down <laughs> once uh, the Navy did kind, there was quite a, there was, there was quite a panic behind that painting and it put Cadmus on the map. Um, and it was taken down. And I'm sure there is a historian somewhere who does know where it is now, because I, oh, yeah. I'd like well, to I hope, they know I'd like where hope it, it wasn't destroyed. Yeah, I think they know where it is, um, but no, oh, it no is. longer hangs in the Pentagon. Um, <laughs> well, with that, that concludes this evening's programming. I'd like to thank our speaker, Miss Bob Davis, and the Lee Lawrence Transgender Archive. Thank and you for inviting me. I'd specifically want to acknowledge your dedication, compassion, and commitment to our community. Um, you're magnificent and an amazing role model, uh, as was said. <sighs> thank you so much for being you and for doing what you do. Um, I'd also like to thank our viewers for attending and their insightful questions, their encouraging comments. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, everyone who to, who's here or who was dropped in. Yeah. And, we hope that this presentation helped bring transgender people and their histories into a better perspective. Um, please join us at this time tomorrow for our last installment when we will honor, memorialize, and remember the transgender people who have lost their lives and whose lives were ended too soon by suicide and anti-transgender violence in 2020. I hope the rest of your night is a good one and remember, you're never alone. Never. We'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. Bye-bye.